if you're going to work on customer acquisition, now is the time to do it because three months from now, you're going to have a massive list of people that normally probably wouldn't have shopped and would have just gone to the store. So you're going to want to retarget them. You're going to want to keep it. Your- Welcome to the Winning E-Commerce Experience Show, where it's all about creating a brand that your customers love so they keep coming back. This show is brought to you by DataQ. Your store experience begins with your home page. DataQ improves your conversion rate up to 30% by showing each visitor a personalized home page based on their interest. And now your host, Sharam Anver. All right, hello and welcome to the show. So today we've got a very special guest, called Andrew Math, uh, who's a founder and CEO of, uh, CEO of Blue Tasker. He's had 12 years of experience in e-commerce, uh, working in multiple agencies. He actually sold one recently. So he's a very successful guy, and I think we're very happy to have him here, and we're really looking forward to having a conversation on what the future of e-commerce is going to look like, because I think, uh, Andrew, you and I we were just talking about it earlier. Things are going to be very mm-hmm. different. Yeah, yeah, appreciate you having me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's funny, a, a month ago, this conversation would have seemed ridiculous. <laughs> and now, now I have no idea what's going on. Uh, you know, we're all like locked in yeah. the house trying to figure out when we're going to get out and what's going to happen. And is business going to be better? Or is it going to be worse? It's definitely a very interesting time. You mentioned, right, that you've been in this industry for 12 years. Can you think of any other time in the 12 years that you've been working on e-commerce that you've seen even something remotely similar to what we're going through right now? Uh, no. <laughs> no, not really. I mean, you had the, the recession, you know, in, in 08, which obviously is another That's aspect true. of what everyone's worried about right now, whether, you know, the U.S. market's going to go into another recession and all that. But that was close. Mm-hmm. This one's very interesting just because it, it, it kind of feels like it happened overnight, in which case, like, all of a sudden, you know, we're all locked up. We're not leaving our houses, at least most of us. <laughs> and, um, you know, and then all of a sudden the market's going down with it. And it's just like, you're sitting at home going, whoa, what is happening right now? <laughs> so it's, uh, I've definitely never had to deal with this. Um, it's interesting, you know, with, with newer times, with newer technologies and software and things like that, like, it's really interesting to see a lot of the data change mm-hmm. from, you know, just a week over week as, you know, normally you're looking at stuff in month over month or year over year for seasonality, but even the past week, the craziest thing we saw that we didn't even think about was going to happen was at the same ad spend where most of our clients worked, most of the clients we work with didn't want to like touch anything. They're like, I don't want to increase budget right now. Mm-hmm. I don't want to decrease it. Let's see what happens. Sounds fair. This past, this past week, everyone's impressions skyrocketed and no one touched their budget. Like spend was basically the same. CPMs came way down. And click-through rates skyrocketed, which obviously we even had conversion rates skyrocket. And we were like, what What just happened? Yeah. And what we started to think about is everyone's just sitting at home, <laughs> like bored. Yeah, so they're sitting on their phones, they're sitting on their laptops, whatever. So there's more ad, like real estate. So there's more people, which means if there's more real estate, there's less demand, which means your price, your cost per click is coming down. And so everyone's just bored. So they're clicking on stuff. They're like, screw it. I'll click on this ad. I don't have nothing to do right now. And people that are interested in, in the product are buying. And the, the thing we're talking about that I'm worried about right now is, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people have already lost their jobs. We have no idea when they're going to get their job back. Yeah. And I'm, I'm worried for some people that they're just spending right now, like they have their job because it hasn't hit them yet that, we might be locked up for the next 30 to 60 days. But even this past week is, is just very interesting in the way that just the data reacted, let alone, you know, the way the whole world is going right now. So, so you think there's some kind of like a like comfort buying, if that makes sense? Like you think people are just purchasing because they're just bored at home, not thinking about the economics of it? Yeah, I, I mean, shopping typically, you know, for every product, every category, every company is widely, wildly different. You have B2B stuff that does better during the week. You have B2C stuff that does better on the weekend. You have, you know, certain things that sell better on a Thursday than they do on a Sunday. So everything's kind of sure. you know, different, but usually you'll see a spike on the weekend on average from, 
just consumers having more time sitting at home and shopping. So mm-hmm. now they're all at home 24 seven for a giant eight weekend. On end. Yeah, it's a giant weekend. And everyone who's never worked from home before doesn't have that discipline to actually be working. So with no boss, <laughs> you know, leaning over your, your shoulder, seeing what you're doing. There's so many people right now who are just sitting at home doing nothing and, and you know, playing on their phones. And then there's the people, obviously, who don't have that opportunity. You have, you know, servers from restaurants and cooks and, you know, all these different, like, all these companies that have shut down and all these people are unfortunately sitting at home right now waiting for their company to open back up. So they're just sitting at home. And yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's some comfort shopping going on, which, you know, is definitely possible. But I think it's also a matter of it, it, it takes a little while to hit you that you no longer have a job. Um, it's when uh, it's when you expect that paycheck to come in and then it doesn't is when you go, oh, wait. <laughs> Sure. Coming back to sort of on a personal note, you 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 just added your agency uh, Blue Tusker, so I'm 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 pretty sure this affects you quite a bit as well. So you know, <laughs> what, what was the story behind like why you started a new agency, and maybe you can uh, tell us a bit about like what you're going through <laughs> right now, thinking about all this as a as a business owner yourself. Yeah. So we uh, <laughs> the timing was great. Um, <laughs> Luckily, you know, the prior uh, exit helps. Um, Obviously, you know, I'm not panicking right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, We're kind of taking things slow in in the way that we want to set things up. We're doing this one a little bit differently. Um, So we sold off an agency in September that was solely e-commerce. And now Blue Tusker e-commerce is definitely one of its specialties and is one of the main areas that we focus in but we're incorporating a lot of other industries and we're making it not just an agency, but also a media company. So as things start to grow, we're putting a lot of our funding back into providing content, whether it's, you know, doing podcasts like this or, you know, daily newsletters and blog posts and videos and, and becoming really kind of a center for the industry, e-commerce being one of them, but one of the other ones that we started at the same time was uh, the staffing industry. So working with staffing agencies and helping them find candidates and clients. And I can tell you that this was a horrible time to do that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, that's two strikes, Andrew. I know. Luckily, the e-commerce side, I don't think is doing that bad, at least not yet. Um, I know a lot of people that are panicking. I had a lot of sellers that, you know, were were lucky enough that were able to make the what I believe to be the correct move, which was as soon as we found out, that, you know, this is going to, we're going to be here for a while. Um, About two weeks ago, when we saw this starting to come on the horizon, I had a lot of them go out and get as much inventory as possible. Get your manufacturers Mm -hmm. going. I don't know what your lead time is, but if you you run out of stock, you're you're screwed. So I need you to get as much product as possible and put it on the shelf. Worst case scenario, we will find a way to discount it and liquidate it if we have to, but you don't want to be out of stock too early. So now what we're doing is we're focusing on profitability, which obviously everyone's always saying like, of course, you're always supposed to focus on profitability. But this time the difference is trim way back, like way, way back. Get rid of any unnecessary software if you can sit there and go like a month without it. Um, or don't do any crazy paid ad tests. Now is not the time to try a new audience on Facebook. It's just what's working. Leave that on. Let's get some product going. Let's, let's hoard as much cash as we can and just coast through this. My assumption, obviously Trump spoke uh, yesterday and today saying that, you know, for in the States, we should be back up and running by Easter, whether that's true or not, we'll find out. But my assumption is it'll probably go another week or two after that. So I think by late, mid to late uh, April is when people will start to be able to go back to it. Um, and if you can hold your business strong through then, which a month and a half for e-commerce is, is hard, mm-hmm. then you should be okay. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that's where it's going, at least in the next 30 days. But they also said that the next like two to three weeks are supposed to be the worst. Mm -hmm. So the biggest thing we're doing is just focusing on all of our clients to just take a deep breath. Don't do anything crazy. Let's just, let's just ride out the next two or three weeks and then let's make a decision. 
because too many sellers will panic and be like, that's it. I'm, you know, I'm going out of business and I got to close and this is happening. Like, no, 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 calm down. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we, we talked about this just before we started the show and I, I guess it depends a lot on the kind of products you sell. Right. So, so for instance, if you know, you've got a product that can be sold during this period, then yes, it makes, I, I guess it makes total sense to figure out your inventory. But if you don't see a way that people are going to, that, that your products are in demand, then maybe you shouldn't go out there and get as much inventory because that might negatively affect your cash flow. Would you, do you, would you agree or? Yeah. So yes, it, like kind of like I mentioned before, every, you know, every product, every business is completely different. So that, you know, yeah. if you're, especially if you're B2B, and you're doing like four or $5,000, like floor machines is one of the companies we work with. Don't, don't stock up on inventory. That's a horrible idea. I mean, we were just talking about how <laughs> um, people should be changing their strategy depending on the kind of products they have, right? So something yeah. that they think oh, is going yeah. to be in demand, then yes, then maybe we have strategy A, but then maybe um, if you don't think your products are going to sell, then you probably need to think about this a little differently. Yes, exactly. So we work we kind of have a, a multi-channel approach we work with a ton of amazon sellers almost everyone we work with is also on amazon mm -hmm. and then obviously everyone's also off amazon at least they should be at this point um amazon's had an interesting thing where this past weekend they are no longer guaranteeing non-essential products to show up before april 21st mm -hmm. so for everyone who listens to this podcast later on that's about a month from now. So for something that you would normally, you know, you're paying Amazon to get something in two days, you're not getting it for a month. Now the interesting thing that we've seen is that a lot of our sellers who do really well on Amazon normally with non-essential products or so something that not everyone's hoarding right now, their websites are actually doing better because now mm. a, you know, five to seven business day shipping time isn't that bad. Now it's, now it's tolerable. Sure. So the traffic's actually kind of shifting away from Amazon. The essential ones, it's a little bit different. Obviously, everyone's hoarding everything that they can right now. Um, those are the ones where we're like, you know, get into stock as much as you can and just, you know, ride this out for as long as possible. But don't, if you have essential products, those are the ones where, or at least the ones that Amazon referred to as, those are the ones that are a little more difficult because you don't really know when people are going to stop shopping the way that they're shopping right now. Yeah. And you also don't really know if, you know, you just got way too much inventory and then you're going to be sitting on inventory or dealing with fees and things like that. But if you have your own warehouse, obviously it's not that big of a deal. Or, yeah. And then, so, you know, sometimes with essentials, it also includes food, right? So hopefully they're not perishable. So then you've also got the time value of the inventory there. Exactly. You know, if you're looking at, you know, lead times normally now they mean nothing in, in terms of you can't really figure out how quick something is selling. If it's a food, that's a lot more difficult. I only have a couple that are in like the perishable side and they are, they didn't really do too much too, cra too crazy. They kind of just said, you know what, let's, let's ride this out. A lot mm -hmm. of them are more focused on brand awareness right now. So it's kind of like traffic is traffic. And I still find that food and, and perishables do better in retail than they do on e-commerce. And e-commerce actually becomes a bit more of a, uh, like an area to kind of pour gas in the fire to get people to go right. to the store to purchase those kinds of things. Yeah, I mean, typically with these kind of stores, you see that um, physical store sales tend to be something like 90, 95% and e-commerce is growing, but it's very small. And this could be one of the things that changes very quickly, right? In the next, say, six months, um, where you're going to see much more focus on the e-commerce channel because people just simply can't go outside and buy stuff. Yeah. I mean, you're about to go through a month to two months where people are required to stay in their house. And if they want something, they have to have it delivered to them which means the people who would normally go to retail now don't even have that as an option. So right. they're being forced to get used to e-commerce. So if, if you're going to work on customer acquisition, now is the time to do it because three months from now, you're going to have a massive list of people that normally probably wouldn't have shopped from you and would have just gone to the store. 
So you're going to want to retarget them. You're going to want to keep it, your, you know, your name in front of them and email marketing, social media, and everything you can do to stay in front of them and keep them as a customer. So it's going to be all about retention after the next few months because you're about to get a whole pool of, you know, people that normally would not have shopped with you. Right, right. I mean, just coming back to that earlier topic of how you should uh, change your strategy depending on your inventory. I think, you know, the really easy one is if you're having essentials. I, I think, um, well, let's not say it's easy, but at least it, it, it tells you what you should do in the short term. And then I guess the one that's a little bit more complicated is things like lifestyle, where you still have an avenue to make people's lives better because they're in quarantine and things like that. The third category, I guess, is where it gets a bit tricky, where um, there's no clear need right now. And if there's a merchant listening in right now and they can't really see a way of, you know, uh, generating demand for their products in the next, say, few months, what would be your advice to them? Like, what should they do? It's kind of dependent on your brand and the way you've been approaching things. Like, to give you an example, like one seller, love this guy, I've been working with him for years. He sells collegiate apparel. So it's just college, university, clothes, hoodies, right. you know, jackets, stuff like that. And March Madness got canceled. And I thought the guy was going to cry. Like it was so, <laughs> oh, I no. felt so bad for him because it's a great season for him. It's his last like really good month. And then summer comes in, there's no college sports on anymore and everything kind of teeters off. And he's clearly a lifestyle. Every single one of his products um, on Amazon isn't getting shipped out until 21st and everything online just kind of is like, there's no like real fun to it behind it anymore because there's no games going on. So we started to work with him on focusing on really just kind of uh, almost like a, uh, like a okay. reminiscent kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, okay. flashback to older games and, and featuring some of those products that, you know, some of those older teams may have had like March Madness is going on right now. So we'll work on, you know, showcasing big plays from past March Madness games. It's a lot and of nostalgia. Then have the, yeah, thank you, nostalgia. That was the one I was looking for. Um, <laughs> Not so. So, you know, it, it kind of depends on the product line and it's going to be very different. I would personally work on trying to sell to my current customers and wouldn't worry too much about trying to acquire new customers. And again, sure. that kind of depends because if you have a business where you're lucky enough to have, you know, some kind of repeat purchasing, that's a different story. But if you have something like, you know, it's more of a lifestyle and people purchase it like once every six months or something, I would really focus more on your current customers and not new ones because customer acquisition costs can be a little bit higher sometimes, especially now when everyone's kind of like iffy on what they want to buy. They want things they're comfortable with. Now is not the time to have to deal with a return. So they're only going to deal with, you know, something that they're comfortable with. So I would focus more on what can I give my current customers that will keep them happy and will get them through this. Right. I mean, and on that, on that note, um, we've seen Shopify, for instance, open up the gift cards feature for all plans. So, you know, even if you're completely out of options, that could be something where, you know, I think there's a few countries where it's just completely on lockdown and you can't even get your orders out. So that could be another mm -hmm. thing which you can reach out to your current customers to get some support where they buy your gift cards and then maybe you can give them a discount once you can send out orders. Yeah, I, there's a ton of different strategies. You know, the gift card thing, I love that one and doing like, you know, buy, you know, spend X amount and get X off. So you're kind of like investing into shopping with us again in the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, obviously standard discount stuff is one thing. If you can do something tied to a charity, so, you know, 10% of all proceeds are going to go to, you know, some COVID-19 charity that's set up in, in their city or in their community so that they can show they're helping their community already. Like there's a lot of other strategies. It's going to, that's going to be dependent on who your audience is and you're yeah. going to have to really sit down and figure out what they're more likely to react to. Yeah. And then, you know, on the extreme end of things, you've got um, people like industries like travel, which are just completely, you know, sucker punch right now. And, you know, one of the strategies which I've been reading is that if you're in any of these industries, you might as well just stop thinking about the short term and just, plan for 2021 right now because no one is going to be yeah. traveling or you know anything like that in the next few weeks or even months 
Uh, yeah. So, you know, if you fall onto that other end of that <laughs> um, extreme, hopefully you have enough cash to hold on, but that could be probably the only strategy you have. Yeah. If you're lucky enough to have enough cash to hold on, um, like right now, one of the things that I'm actually secretly loving about all this is that it's very slow. No one wants to do anything crazy. No one wants to, you know, put any major campaigns together. No one even wants to plan anything until like June right now because they're just too afraid what's going on because everything has kind of slowed down and come to a standstill. And we're kind of just, you know, make everything as just business as usual. It's a perfect opportunity for every business to sit down and focus on their systems. Look at your process and focus on efficiencies because what you're going to have to do is as soon as everything starts to get, as soon as everything starts to pick up again, if you're more efficient, you'll see that money come back that much quicker. We're focusing on, you know, we have all of our project management systems and things set up and I'm going through and we're taking all of our free time right now and just combing through them and making sure like everything is up to par, everything is, you know, templated out and it is perfect. So when we have new people coming in, we already have everything lined up. And same thing with our current clients we're working with. We're going, okay, we know that this last campaign went well. Let's tweak this for them. Like we have so much extra time that we've actually started to focus more on how can we make everything more efficient. And for every e-commerce company, they should be doing the exact same thing. How can you make stuff more efficient? So when this happens again, or even three, four months from now, you're immediately getting things done on a much faster pace. Oh man, I, I love that so much because I mean, just from a, even from a psychological point of view, just getting away from the short term panic kind of thinking and getting into sort of this long term planning that you're talking about, I think it just also relaxes you. I think it calms you down and like really forces you to think in a more positive, constructive way rather than freaking out because that can just be debilitating, right? So, you know, that's yeah. another aspect that I really love about what you just said. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, we're all, we're all guilty of it. I'm definitely guilty of it of, you know, how many clients do we bring in? How many, you know, what's their revenue at? What's this at? What's that at? And you're, you're bogged down with all of these like really short-term goals. And right now, none of those short-term goals are going to happen. So it's just a matter of, okay, we're here. This is, you know, let's, let's take a step back. And now let's, let's all take a step back and take a look at what we've been doing. How can we do it better? Because everything's on hold right now. We're all still here. We're all fine. We're all at home. You can do it comfortable. You can sit in your pajamas. You could do it and, you know, halfway through the afternoon, have a drink. I don't care. Sit there and just let's find <laughs> out the best ways to make everything that much more efficient. Let's say like, oh, you know, we don't like so-and-so's emails the way they look. Or we don't like the social like design that we're using. Like, great. Let's fix it. We have all the time in the world right now. Like, let's tweak some things. Now is the time to change stuff that you didn't like what you were doing before because you can't really focus on sales. You can't really focus on generating new business right now because everyone's scared. So everyone's on a hold. So if you're going to fix up your business, you got to do it now. So out of all the processes that, you know, when you're running an e-commerce, there's just a ton of things that you've, you've got to do. Which ones would you say you'd prefer people look at uh, to improve efficiency? If, you know, if I had a whole bunch of processes like inventory management, my delivery, blah, blah, blah you know, stuff that up your head, which ones would you tell people listening in to definitely start with? Customer service. Okay. I, like I would that. actually go that route because in a time like right now, you don't want to deal with a company that has bad customer service that you can't get a hold of, that you have to sit on a phone and talk to a robot, or, you know, you're dealing with these headache of returns you don't want to you know, comment on someone's social post or leave a review and not get some kind of feedback. You don't want to tweet at a company asking about your order and not get a response. Like Now is the time to be connecting with your existing customer as best as you can. So any way that you can find efficiencies in making sure that you have your brand voice nailed, everyone is on the same page in your customer service team, they're all responding as quickly and as as appropriately as they possibly can, that will keep people happy because everyone's on edge right now. And as soon as, you know, something doesn't go wrong, now is the time to fix it because then they'll still be there three months from now, six months from now when all this is over. I mean, would you recommend for them to be 
proactive. So I've seen a few stores where they've actually created a whole new page and uh, about the COVID-19 and just discussed all these topics like how does this affect your delivery? Um, what are we doing to disinfect our products? Blah, 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 blah. Are there anything else that you've seen uh, with merchants that you work with where they've sort of tried to get ahead of it and try to make their customers feel a little bit better? Yeah, um, we, uh, for a few merchants, because of the way that they had, you know, the way that their business is run, we did have just like a pop-up that kind of explains like, hey, before you start doing anything, you know, mm -hmm. here's what you need to know that's a little bit different than usual. A lot of them, we've set up just an automated uh, email workflow. So after they've placed an order, we give them a little bit more insight about something that might be happening. But the mass emails of every company that I've ever signed up for a newsletter for reaching out to us saying like, you know, we're here for you and we're doing this and we're doing that. Like it's already to the point where everyone's just like, okay, enough. Like we get it. You're all here for us. <laughs> blah, blah. A lot of times they'll send this email and it'll be from, it'll, it'll pretend to be from the founder. It'll be like four or five paragraphs long. And at the end of it, you're learning that they're changing nothing. They're like, great. Okay. <laughs> or they'll say like, Hey, we want you to know that we have more customer service reps on board right now. They're like, great. You should have had that before. Like, I, I don't right. like a lot of it's not really doing too much for me. So I'm not doing anything really like proactively reaching out and saying like, Hey, you haven't shopped with us in a while, but we're here for you. Like, I'm not doing any of that, but I am doing you know, if you are shopping with us, you are working with us right now, here's what's going on. We want to be very, very transparent. Um, we've put, you know, different chats set up where we've actually reduced the amount of bots that we normally would have set up and make sure that they're getting a person as fast as possible. You know, here's our direct number. If you have a question while you're placing an order, like there's wow. also a lot more people online right now that aren't used to shopping online. So you don't want to have you know, some crazy weird bot where you're, at, it's got to ask 500 questions and, you know, you, they can't talk to a person. And don't get me wrong. I love those because they can definitely take away some of the, you know, odds and ends that you don't want to deal with. But sure. right now you're dealing with people who normally don't shop online. So you want to make sure that they can get a person and love their experience as much as possible. At least let's talk about the e-commerce companies now, which has products that we that are going to be in demand in the next three months because we're seeing at least we asked, we expect that we're going to see a lot of new faces who haven't really shopped online before do you think there's going to be some work needed to actually change the ui or the ux a little bit to make it easier for sort of first-time shoppers to get to know your brand and get get to the checkout process faster could this be one of the other areas you can sort of people should be working on to make it more efficient yeah, I mean, obviously your your UX, like the whole front end of your website is something that you should be looking at, you know, quarterly at, at minimum, um, let alone the fact that this is going on right now. Obviously, this is a fantastic time to audit your own website, figure out, you know, how, where can you reduce a click? You know, how can you personalize a certain section? How can you make something easier? And my favorite thing to do is, and my person, my wife hates it, but I still make her do it. When I get, when I start working with someone new and we clean up their website, I take the website that she's never seen before and I put it in front of her. I go, here's, you know, here's the card, go buy this. And I'll watch how she uses it because she's never used it before. Because the problem is you'll sit there and you'll look at something for days and hours. And if you're the owner, you've looked at it for years. So it's kind of like, you know, it starts to get a little bit like, okay, um, you know, you're, you're too deep in it. So you try to, you, it's difficult to take a step sure. back. So you give it to someone who's never seen the site before, let them dig through it. Um, I don't know if there's going to be any major changes to a website based on the new type of customer base that's using a website. I would like to mm -hmm. think that most websites at this point, at least they should be, you know, they should have all of the standard things that are simple. Obviously, they should be mobile friendly. They should be responsive. Mm -hmm. Like the stuff that's been drilled into your head for the past 10 years, like mm -hmm. none of that's changing. Mm -hmm. So as long as your site is already up to a standard, you should always be striving to make it as simple as possible, as quick as possible for someone to make a decision and make a sale. So there's new people, but if you've been doing your due diligence prior to this, and you've really been making sure that your website's, you know, like, like working as fast as possible and it's, you know, there's no lag time on it, you should be fine. Yeah, I guess it goes back to your original advice, right? Don't do anything crazy right now. Just 
do your basics and don't do anything, don't do any big changes and just react to the data, what it's showing you. So I guess this also falls under that category. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't do any tests right now. Honestly, I don't even really want to do any tests right now, whether they're, you know, stuff you already have set up, like you're just doing a basic like landing page test or copy or creative or anything like that. But the problem is, is like, obviously I've seen from this past week, as I mentioned earlier, like the traffic is so crazy right now and everyone's just clicking stuff. They're bored. Mm. So the, the data that we're getting is almost, a, it's kind of like you want to take it with a grain of salt. So even if you were to do a test right now, you don't know if people are going to act like that, you know, four or five months from now when it's, you know, summer and it's beautiful out and everyone wants to go outside and now no one's clicking. So all of a sudden you have this landing page. It's not converting as well because of this and that. And so it's kind of like a, I wouldn't test anything right now. I would be focused on efficiencies and just making sure that everything is running as good as it possibly can. Right. This this makes me think about it because, you know, we talked about new people coming into e-commerce and that was from sort of the customer side. But, you know, before the show, we were also talking about people who are coming into e-commerce from the supply side. So you've got a lot of brick and mortar stores who... Mm-hmm just weren't really online and now you know shopify for instance has has launched a three-month free trial Uh, there's a whole bunch of activity now where people are just desperately getting online because it's the only way that they can actually get the product to the customer so yeah you know listening to this conversation i'm sure somebody who hasn't been online or hasn't sold online like they're probably already getting thrown off with all the terms like customer acquisition email seo blah 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 so, you know, if, if you were talking to somebody today who's just like, just wants to get online and sell their products, you know, what would mm-hmm. your advice be to them? Like, where should they start? What should they do? To be <laughs> Sorry to put honest, you on the spot, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a to tough be, point. To be very honest with you, I would tell them, don't do it. And, and the only reason I say that is, is wow, this, okay. has gotta be, this has got to be the worst time to start an e-commerce website mm-hmm. because you can't, it's not. You know, this isn't 10 years ago. This isn't you put up a product on Amazon and all of a sudden you're rich. You, you don't build a website and go, oh man, all of a sudden I have all this traffic. Like you got to do a ton of content. You have to do, you have to grow your social media. You have all this other stuff. And you're, if you're just now building an e-commerce website, that means that either A, you're a local brick and mortar where you just have the products that are shipped to you in your one spot, which means only the people in your community know you. Or B, you're a smaller merchant who has your product maybe nationally, maybe internationally, but you have no online presence, uh, at least in comparison, because you focus solely on retail. So mm-hmm. you're going to start your e-commerce business right now. You're going to have to invest in it. I never suggest that you go out and get one of those Shopify templates that you piecemeal together over the weekend and then just start something because they just don't convert as well. People know that they're like templated, like they all look, you know, they all kind of look the same. You want to have your own brand feel, your own aesthetic, your own voice, like you want it to be your own. And if you're not providing an experience right now, you're already starting to lose people. So if you're going to really put the investment into doing e-commerce correctly, I, I personally think now's just not the time to do it because it, this is a, a bad time to build a brand because everyone just wants to feel comfortable they're going to shop with people that they're most comfortable with right now so you would have to have a ton of you know social proof you'd have to have a ton of reviews online for a lot of people saying this product's great so i would just say that that's a very difficult way to go if they had to do it Mm -hmm. honestly like the quickest way to do it at least to deal with it over the next few months you could go the pay, the paid advertising route or maybe you could attempt to do more like i guess uh more organic content where you're really just filming off your phone and you're kind of doing it on a much much more personal level i've obviously seen that do very well um but it's still going to be a very difficult uh it's going to be a difficult mountain to climb at least right now with what's going on yeah, I guess it really helps if you are a small local store that's got um, some sort of community, um, let's say, recognition. And even though you don't have anything online, but maybe you've got some email addresses or things like that of people who you think could support you. And then 
they could be sort of your first few customers that you even email and say, hey, would you be interested in buying something online? So sort of like a quick test uh, rather than starting from scratch. Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you're a brick and mortar, then I 100% believe if you're, I'm sorry, if you're a local brick and mortar where you're really just, you know, you're in your community and you're owning that community, that I would definitely suggest going the personal route. You want to become like people want to know your face. So do videos in your house of you. You know, if you're, let's say you're a local pet shop, do videos in your house of you yeah. and your pets. Ask other people in the community to send you video of their pets. Like what's everyone doing with their pets? How are you guys keeping busy with your pets? Like stuff like that. So you're building community, you're building conversation around your brand and on your page and let them know like, Hey, I can still ship things out to you guys or Hey, let's do a, let's, I'll set something up online. You can purchase it online and I will place it outside my store and you can drive by and pick it up. You won't have to touch it. Like <laughs> you can go that right. whole route where it's all right. clean. I'll sanitize it. Like there's other ways you can do that, especially if you're just on a, on more of a local level. Right. For anyone listening, if you want to just go get online and start selling, then the way not to do it would be just to whip up something really quick and put it out there, which looks terrible. Um, you're probably going to hurt the brand that you've built so carefully over the last few years, right? So you need to find a way to transfer all of that goodwill that you've built in the community online. So, you know, try to follow some of the tips that Andrew just had, like doing videos and things like that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, it, and it's also going to hurt you just emotionally because you're, you're obviously, if you're doing something like that, you're really struggling, you're starting to panic. And if you just throw something up and do it wrong, it's not going to go well. And then you're going to think, okay, now the world is definitely coming into an end. I'm never going to sell anything. Like it's, you'll stay calm. You'll be okay. Do maybe just do social media and take your products and put them up on Facebook marketplace. Like that's where your community is at right now. Yeah. See if it'll work that way. Like there's, there's slower ways to do things and other avenues to sell stuff than, you know, launching a, a entire Shopify website right now. Yeah. And I think one of the really, like one of the rare good things about what's happening right now is that I find that people are really coming together. Um, people are just really coming out there and just uh, offering their advice for free um they're really sort of like focused on helping each other out and i guess another bit of feedback uh, or advice you could give somebody who's just done a brick and mortar store is just reach out like get on linkedin or what have you and try to reach experts like yourself and try to get in touch and maybe have a conversation and that could be something which um because you know, if, if you've not been in the industry at all you the last thing you want to do is to learn on the job in a time like this right <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly. I mean, it is, it is amazing. And it is actually very cool where, you know, something like this happens and it, it is a shame that it takes something like this for people to, you know, act this way, but everyone is so nice right now. Like it is amazing. I've seen, uh, I've seen competitors um, on LinkedIn sharing stuff together. You know, I've seen even just like, you know, get tired of sitting in the house and take your dog for a walk and the like, neighbors are all out they're all real nice and they're like hey but they're waving from the other side of the road yeah. <laughs> like you know it's, it's at uh, the two it's meter just, distance <laughs> exactly like i've spoken to more people i've spoken to more strangers in this past week in my own neighborhood than i have ever uh just because of how nice everyone is and honestly that's what i've been trying to do too is like you know i'm just trying to provide you know, some extra value for everyone. I have had a lot of merchants who I'm not trying to sell. They'll just tweet at me and they'll be like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm in a rock and a hard place right now. Here's where we're going. Here's what's going on. And I'll just help them. There's, this is not the time to be trying to screw someone over by selling them or upselling them or anything like that. Like yes. right now we all have to team up and we all just have to go. Everyone needs to make it out of this alive. And then Three months from now, if you're one of those people who is constantly cold calling people and like, like bombarding people and like that, by all means, go right back to it. But right now is not the time. Now is everyone just help each other. If you're having trouble and you know someone who can help you, tweet at them or just ask them. I love it. I love it. So, Andrew, how do people get in touch with you after the show? Uh, you've, you've said a lot of really, really good things and I, and I think you've given us a lot, a lot to think about. So I'm sure people would like to talk to you. Yeah. Appreciate you having me. It's a good segue. Obviously you can tweet me. Um, 
<laughs> so the honestly the easiest way is my social everything is just at andrew Maff and d-r-e-w-m-a-f-f you can tweet at me on twitter and linkedin and facebook and instagram all that stuff feel free to dm me and i'll obviously you know if anyone who's listening is having issues with you know the whole COVID 19 thing right now or anything else uh, outside of that even after this feel free to reach out i'm more than happy to uh help out and give my advice where i can awesome well with that thank you very much andrew and we'll see you in the next episode yeah appreciate it you're still here which means you definitely enjoyed that conversation this is a special COVID-19 e-commerce miniseries to help small business merchants out there get prepared. We're doing a lot more of these, so be the first to know whenever there's a new episode. Just follow DataQ, that's D-A-T-A-C-U-E on Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Stay safe out there, everybody. Till next time, this is Sharam.